Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Today's webinar is How Retailers Can Survive Being Amazon with guest speakers, Sucharita Mulperu and Adrian Nussenbaum. A brief overview of what we'll cover today. I'm going to start with some housekeeping and some introductions, then we'll go into the bulk of the presentation on how to combat Amazon and how Miracle can help, and then we'll go into Q&A. If you have any audio issues, please feel free to reach out to Miracle Marketing in the chat section and we can help you take care of those. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please ask them in the questions tab and we'll get them answered for you at the end. Slides and recording of this presentation will be recorded and sent out to you within 48 hours via email. If you'd like to interact with us on Twitter, you can find us at, at Miracle and tweet the hashtag Fight Amazon during the webinar. We're really excited to have Sucharita Mulperu and Adrian on the call today. Sucharita is ranked number one of the top 10 most influ influential people in retail. Previously, she was the chief retail strategist at Shop Talk and worked at Forrester Research as a VP and principal anal analyst for more than a decade. Because of her expertise, she is frequently quoted in leading global business and tech publications. Thanks so much, Sucharita, for joining us today. Adrian is the CEO and co-founder of Miracle. He's a serial entrepreneur with more than 14 years of business development experience. In the past, he's worked on restructuring teams at Deloitte, advising businesses going through transformation, and has been working in marketplaces since 2006. Thank you, Adrian, for joining us as well. Now we're going to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Sucharita. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, per perhaps one of the biggest questions on the minds of everyone today that's in the retail industry is uh, what do you do in the light of the competitive influences and in particular the competitive influences of the company that seems to be um, gobbling up so much of consumer mind share and, uh, and wallet share as well. And uh, what we're going to talk about are some of the high-level consumer um, attitudes and experiences that are shifting and evolving and some of the opportunities that that provides um, for retailers um, in, in light of uh, some of these shifting expectations. Um, so I apologize um, if uh, some of these slides may be a little bit slow, um, but uh, we will uh, do our best to kind of, uh, you know, kind of navigate through and, um, and, and walk you through all of the, the key points that we have here. I'm trying to push this forward, and um, I'm not yet seeing it move. You're good now. Oh, the next page is there? Okay, because it's not yet loaded on my screen. You should be able to push um, it now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Uh, so the agenda for today is uh, really to talk about consumer expectations and how they've evolved, some of the emerging opportunities, and, um, and, and of course, some of the investments that you'll um, that every retailer needs to consider as they think forward to um, how to how to make the most out of this very very hyper competitive retail environment. Um, Hannah, it, I may have you kind of navigate these slides if that's okay. Maybe a little bit faster from from your side. Sure. So the first thing that we want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the consumer experience. And uh, I will walk through um, on the next page a handful of the key points that we've seen evolving and changing with respect to, to shoppers. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, we'll go through each of these individually, so I won't spend a ton of time on, uh, on this first slide. You'll have it as a takeaway um, if you get a copy of this presentation. But um, the first thing we want to spend some time talking about is marketplaces as a service. And we can move to the next slide. Um, certainly, consumer expectations have been shaped by um, the large services marketplaces like Airbnb and Uber, which have really demonstrated that um, there is the ability to aggregate supply and demand in previously 
um, very, very difficult to do so industries where trust um, was elusive and uh, having done that through the aggregation of data and user reviews and um, real-time information to um, allow for for that transparency in the transaction um, has really set the bar high and um, has opened up other opportunities for it, the concept of marketplaces, even in places in retail where they may have not been as um, as, as broadly accepted. Um, and where some of the places in, in physical goods retail where we're seeing marketplaces emerge where they hadn't existed before um, are in high-end fashion. Um, where in the past, some of the challenges with high-end fashion were everything related to the authenticity of the merchandise, to whether or not um, the, uh, the products that were showcased would actually be juxtaposed next to appropriate products. That was always one of the challenges with more mass marketplaces like even eBay, is that um, while there was a breadth of inventory, um, there were still challenges with the very, very high end. And and uh, what you've seen with marketplaces like Farfetch and Lyft is helping both the sellers, that being boutiques or purveyors of merchandise, actually feeling comfortable with putting even their, their newer merchandise and their full price merchandise in these marketplaces, but also providing buyers um, on um, the consumer side with that trust that what the, the shopper would actually be receiving um, was not only high quality, but, um, but actually had um, a lot of the uh, the elements that you would expect from a packaging and you know kind of post purchase services level that were critical in the transaction. Um, we start to see other marketplaces too in retail that I think are transformational. You start to see um, marketplaces for labor like uh, with companies like ShiftGig which allow merchants and retailers um, as, um, as they may need um, temporary labor to fill particular roles in their distribution centers or even in their stores to call on people who could be um, available locally um, and also be trained in very, very specific um, retail technology systems that are often essential to, to getting somebody you know, at the last minute. Um, there's a company called Sunder which actually also aggregates suppliers and um, this is actually probably um, a more 2017 version of even what Alibaba was years ago and uh, what uh, what they're doing is, uh, is is basically matching suppliers of materials particularly fabrics um, that uh, that could be less common or that um, maybe a little bit more difficult to source like certain metallic fabrics or certain um, leather goods and, uh, and, and exposing those to, to buyers who could be looking for large quantities of that type of merchandise. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, the second big point that uh, that we're seeing with respect to changing shoppers is radical transparency. And this is a concept that companies like um, Everlane and Tuft & Needle and Casper um, really pioneered when um, they essentially made um, really public um, the, uh, the components of different costs and how um, their markup varied compared to other comparable products that were also in market. Um, but what we really see, and on the next slide, is, uh, is the opportunity to take this concept of radical transparency into different parts of the retail supply chain and the retail experience. So certainly, um, you know, exposing your cost components to shoppers is one part of it. Um, but I also encourage retailers to think about how much can they expose about every part of the experience. One of the most important parts of the shopping experience is when a package arrives and, um, and uh, what that product actually, um, you know, how well it, it meets the, the shopper's expectations. And uh, being able to expose that um, in excruciating detail um, down to where a particular product could be, at, at, you know, kind of in, in the, the carrier network and when it's expected to arrive. These are all the kinds of things that retailers should be um, looking to, and these are the kinds of things that the top merchants are already doing. So um, the ability to, to, to essentially mimic um, that level of transparency throughout the entire journey um, is something that is, is important and valuable. Um, we can go to the next slide. What we see is that um, the transparency also is um, 
forcing more value for money. And um, what we see in a world where it's a race to the bottom is, um, is, is how do companies differentiate themselves. And when you, when you see a company like Amazon, what's extraordinary is in addition to often leading on price, particularly for key products that are some of its fastest movers, um, you also have um, an unbelievable um, you, you know, kind of bundle that the company is offering through um, a service like Amazon Prime. And a lot of that has to do with everything from free storage for photos to um, a, a significant amount of music and videos and TV shows that come bundled in with that package. Um, in some cases, even video games as well as um, opportunities to to buy into, um, you know, kind of grocery offerings and, and um, the, you know, kind of um, the ability to purchase, um, you know, smaller um, ticket items through through solutions like Pantry. Um, so all of these are, are, you know, raise the bar for other retailers as well. And on the next slide, um, what is important to keep in mind is, uh, is, 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 is where um, retailers need to figure out how they too can um, can deliver more of that value for money. Um, the other piece that's also important to keep in, another element that's important to keep in mind is how shopper attention is in increasingly shifting to mobile devices. And what that means is that consumers um, aren't paying attention to any particular device or even any particular um, media um, uh, vehicle that they may have exposed to them for any great length of time. And that's a concept um, that, um, that we call continuous partial attention. And uh, this was an expression that was coined by a Microsoft employee named Linda Stone many years ago. And um, the idea is that we, um, you know, really are not fully focused on anything anymore um, because we have so much, so many different points of stimuli that are um, that are all fighting for, for our attention. What that means is that the faster that you can enable a retail, a shopper to complete a transaction, the better off that you are. And uh, one of the companies that I think is really, really interesting in how it enables shoppers to complete really fast transactions is a company called Peached, and it is a VC-funded um, food startup, actually. They basically deliver restaurant food to office parks and the way that they capture transactions is that every morning they send out a few menu items and you as a shopper, once you've set up your account, have the ability to just simply text back yes or um, yes A or yes B to basically say what is the, um, the item of the day that you want to order and then it shows up at your office building at, at, a, at a set time and then you'll receive a text that, you know, that it's, it's there for pickup. Um, but the idea is to basically reduce the number of keystrokes in the transaction. You don't even have to really launch an app or go to a particular screen that shows up through a push notification or a text ad and then you just simply have to respond to that, which is um, just a really fast and efficient way to, to address that, that particular issue. And these are the kinds of things that as, um, as retailers you should constantly be thinking about is, is how do you adapt to this world that, that consumers um, need, um, you know, kind of to receive more information in an even shorter compressed period of time, often on their mobile devices. Next slide. Um, part of um, the solution here, um, I would argue, is the concept of distributed commerce, which a couple of years ago um, had a lot of uh, attention from, um, you, know, you know, I think thought leaders in the industry. Um, the challenge with distributed commerce, and distributed commerce is really this notion of companies like, um, like Google or even Facebook being able to capture transactions on their platforms versus passing, um, you know, shoppers through to the retailer site directly. <laughs> These are fabulous ideas in concept, and, um, and all of our data suggests that consumers actually are interested in completing transactions on sites like Instagram and Pinterest, and I would argue that companies like Howes are actually um, illustrating that there is some potential here. The challenge is that um, some of the investments that these mega companies and these mega tech titans have made in distributed commerce probably hasn't been at the level, um, nor has it delivered a, a customer experience that's yet satisfactory. Um, we expect, hopefully, in the next five to 
seven years that they'll actually get to a level where they need to. But at this point in time, what we're still seeing is, um, it, you know, kind of these websites not fully ingesting product data feeds that are that are completely sufficient um, to completing a transaction. Like for instance, you'll see a buy button on Pinterest to buy a shoe, but you won't see a sizing chart. Um, and if you don't see that critical information, um, you know what that means is that the shopper is nonetheless going to go to the retailer site, and that um, that element of you know kind of partial attention, that that microsecond that you have to complete the transaction. Um, will uh, will disappear, and um, you know, kind of that's that's part of the the challenge that retailers have is is how do you you know how do you how do you get the the shopper in that moment that they're most interested in um, completing that transaction? Next slide. Um, we also see the concept of um, services and uh, services being appended to physical goods. And this is also part of um, the more for less concept. And in some cases here, I would argue it's actually more for more. And it's a way to provide value add um, that often traditional retailers may not be as good at. Historically, um, you know, retailers have just been about selling physical goods. But what we're increasingly seeing is the value that additional services like Genius Bar or Geek Squad are having on retail businesses and where there are opportunities to add additional value add. I mean, some of this we're even seeing with Amazon is, um, you know, you purchase certain home goods. You have the opportunity to have installation appended to that particular transaction. And the more that retailers can, um, can, can combine and go deeper into that transaction where they're adding ancillary value um, and potentially even doing it in a way that's profitable to them, like, uh, for instance, just connecting um, a shopper to, uh, to a service provider. That can be incredibly valuable. Um, next slide. I want um, everyone to also think of uh, this idea of services or value-added ways of increasing transactions broader than just um, you know, kind of things like um, installation or services. Um, I would argue that some of it is just about adjacencies and other um, offerings that aren't necessarily well suited to online transactions. And uh, um, part of this is uh, is to look at, um, you know, are there opportunities in things like food services? Because food is something that um, that you know, kind of does have. Some ability, um, you know, to uh, to aggregate demand through through digital, but at the end of the day, it still requires, um, you know, kind of local um, local execution to to do really really well. And um, and and one of the companies that I think is 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 very innovative in in trying to go in this direction is Urban Outfitters. About a year and a half ago, they bought a pizza chain. And um, while the specific strategy um, remains to be seen, what we do know is that at some of the Urban Outfitters flagship stores, food is an increasingly important part of what drives traffic. And uh, we also know at the highest level that um, the restaurant industry is a growth sector within retail. So the ability to, to – and we know that a lot of um, physical um, malls and shopping centers are increasingly occupied by – um, by, by restaurant tenants. Um, so, so these are some of the, the ways that I encourage everyone to think about, you know, the notion of, um, of services beyond, um, you, you know, kind of simply um, the selling and shipping of physical goods. Next slide. Um, we also think of uh, real estate. This is just another example of, of uh, you know, expansion, um, you, you know, kind of when you have additional um, revenue means, whether it's, um, you, you know, kind of monetizing parking or even space for, um, for hotels, for instance. I mean, that's something that we've seen some retailers actually lease out some space um, in their stores, particularly if it's a home goods or apparel merchant. Um, through, you know, by creating rooms for rent, um, you, you know, that are then leased out on um, or made available for, for purchase through um, marketplaces like Airbnb. Next slide. Um, I look at services as well as, as um, the quality of what's provided in the physical store. Um, this is just an example of uh, certain merchants, like, for instance, Container Store and Trader Joe's, which actually pay their store associates more, so they can actually do more with less. Um, and uh, they may not need the volume of store associates, but a lot of those store associates are cross-trained in, uh, in, in a number of different functions in the store, 
and uh, that gives the store that much more latitude from scheduling and um, a store operation standpoint. Next slide. So I think it's also important to um, to look at where um, there are opportunities to, to compete against Amazon. Um, and we'll get into some of the details there. I, I do on the next slide want to point out that so much of what is um, out there is often is often hyped. And um, on the next slide, um, I, I do want to, to point out that um, it's important for retailers to keep um, abreast of some of the changes that are happening in categories like um, augmented reality and uh, delivery. Um, but the truth is, is that um, a lot of the developments in augmented reality or even with drones or driverless cars are still very, very nascent. And um, while they may have use cases in the next decade, um, I will guarantee that these are conversations that we will continue to have into the next decade. Um, and there are a significant number of hurdles that the current executions of augmented reality and drones um, have that aren't even really being addressed. And I think a lot of um, the, 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 the people who are very bullish on these um, solutions um, are seeing what could potentially be possible, but the truth is is that the current solutions um, are, not, um, are not really ready for any kind of mass adoption just yet. I mean, even if you look at things like augmented reality and virtual reality, they haven't even really come into the mainstream for gamers yet. So to expect that they would come into the mainstream as training tools for customers or um, for store associates, I think, is a little bit, um, a, you know, kind of fancy, fanciful and, um, you know, a little bit more um, speculative than, than anything that's, a, that's, that's reality right now. Um, I look at things like drones and driverless cars, and while the future could be really interesting in the future, um, in, in, in the years to come, um, there's still so much regulation. Um, even with driverless cars, the, um, the, the you, you know, kind of, and you look at some of the more advanced technologies that, that do exist, like, um, like with Tesla, even um, those, um, you know, even those use cases are, are, are very, are, are still finite at this moment in time. Um, it's uh, for, for solutions like parking and, um, you know, kind of maybe, you know, kind of short distance driving, um, the, uh, it, you know, kind of, and, and then on top of that, there are any number of challenges with respect to um, how well these particular solutions are priced and, um, and, and whether or not, um, you know, consumers are, are actually ready to buy or adopt them. Um, so all of these, I think, are, 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 are interesting concepts that down the road could be transformational, um, but unfortunately, they're, they're unlikely to have that much of an impact in, in the near term. And, um, you know, kind of a lot more of our imagination will be captured by what's possible rather than um, the reality of, uh, of, of any mass adoption, even with respect to sensors or wearables. Um, my challenge with sensors is that, that while there is tremendous value in things like RFID, um, even those have not come into the mainstream yet, and the pricing hasn't come down to a level that is, um, has allowed mass adoption. And, um, and therein lies some of the, the challenges with, uh, with retail overall. So on the next slide, we'll get to a little bit more of, well, what are the right investments that retailers do need to make? And, um, and I want to, you know, kind of uh, leave you with some, some um, you know, kind of thoughts here, which is um, you want to um, recognize these trends that are shape, shaping customer experiences, whether it is um, the ubiquity of marketplaces or radical transparency. And, um, and what we see there is that, you know, marketplaces really – do enable retailers to address all of these changes in consumer expectations, um, whether it is the fact that, you know, kind of retailers want buyers and sellers aggregated in digital domains, um, or whether it is that, um, you know, consumers want to see variability in pricing and what is, um, you, you know, kind of what are, what's the, um, complete universe of offerings that could be available to them. What are the different bundles that are available? Um, whether it's providing um, cost um, efficiencies and being able to provide 
um, the, the lowest price for a particular offer. Um, and whether it is about providing one-stop shopping um, or even the ability to provide, um, you know, appending on services and, um, you know, non-physical goods to a transaction, um, all of these are solutions that marketplaces enable. And, um, and that really is what that, you know, kind of where, where I look to is that even though the customer experience has been shaped um, by so many valuable um, digital um, changes that consumers expect, um, these are some approaches that, that retailers have that they can employ um, that would not only address the customer experience, but would also do so in a way that is useful and cost effective for them. Next slide. Um, so, I, I, you know, when I look at the value of marketplaces, to me, there are a number of tremendous benefits that are provided. Um, there is choice for the customer that really a marketplace provides. There's not a single marketplace out there, whether it's eBay or Etsy um, or Airbnb, that, that, uh, that does not have a relatively comprehensive offering. Um, as a result of that comprehensiveness and um, a variety of different price points and often search results that can help a, you know, a customer narrow down what they're looking for that delivers a great customer experience, particularly when you have feedback tools that, um, that can help to prioritize who the good merchants are and who the good sellers really are. Um, it is a great experience for shoppers too because, um, you, you know, kind of it's a one-stop shop where um, there is uh, ease in the transaction. There is, um, you know, you don't have to go search around to multiple sites and uh, guess what are the keywords that you need to be looking up on Google. Um, all of that ends up being mapped according to, um, you know, kind of inferences and, you know, some of the smart machine learning that these tools have. Um, and perhaps one of the most important parts of marketplaces is that fundamentally the nature of them allow them to be very, very lucrative for the marketplace provider um, because it is uh, it's essentially aggregating demand and um, you have uh, you, you know kind of this this asset light you know kind of execution where where you're basically um, a allowing the heavy investment to happen through your sellers next slide when I look to the future of retail there are a number of different takeaways that I think are important to, to keep in mind and um, if I have to make some predictions they are the following um, one is that there are going to be fewer mono brands um, in, in the world in the future, mainly because any company that's in the middle, if you're not um, really high end, it's going to be hard to be a mono brand. And, um, you know, kind of what we see is, um, is that, um, you, you know, kind of you're going to have, um, have uh, many of these um, vertically integrated um, companies or previously vertically integrated, integrated companies deciding to sell through partners and um, and that's that's really part of the future that that I expect um, I see that we'll have more um, fewer open to buys and uh, what that means is that the budgets that merchants have to work with to to actually invest in inventory will be lower um, because you will have more um, inventory um, being sold through marketplaces. And as more, e more commerce goes to dot-com, more of that dot-com will go through marketplaces. And, uh, and what that means is that merchants really will only have control over what's sold in physical stores. And even of what's sold in physical stores, I imagine a lot of that inventory, um, the ownership may shift to, uh, to more of a consignment model or more of a, um, a wear room model where you may have the store uh, being um, where there are more of the, you know, kind of um, the, the floor samples are, but, but ultimately, um, you know, kind of more of the inventory is, is, is held in local distribution centers. Um, you, I expect that, that um, it, it, you know, kind of the merchant is still important to supplement um, data that exists from consumers as to what are people searching for. The truth is that there are hundreds of millions of items out there and, um, and retailers still um, benefit from editing assortments. And um, it, you know, kind of those, um, those, those roles um, may not be quite as, as senior or as high level because 
um, they they are you, you can, more of this is going to be about um, you know kind of mining trends, um, but uh, but but that that I think is is an important distinction in how that role of the merchant changes. Um, I do expect other functions to emerge in retail, creative functions in particular like photography, um, as as well as even you know kind of copywriting. We expect um, to become even more popular as as more. Um, shifts to digital needs. Um, we expect um, that that branded um, manufacturers are likely to see their margins decline um, over time, particularly if they're commoditized goods. Um, and um, what we'll also see is is more and more of these branded manufacturers um, finding the imperative to invest in in innovation wherever it's possible. And some of the best brands have, of course, invested in innovation all along. Um, but I expect that to be even more than ever. Um, and finally, um, you know, kind of this was my supplement to the point I'd made about like the container store, store associates, which is that um, we do expect fewer store associates in the future, but the ones that remain um, are going to have to be much more technology savvy. They're going to have to be much more versatile um, and much more useful to, uh, to, to everyone in the, the shopping experience. And, um, and that's really where, um, where, where the value um, to the consumer is and the reason to continue to come back to physical stores. Um, so that takes me to the end of my slides. And then um, I think we can go to the next slide. And that brings it back, I think, to the Miracle team. Adrian, you should have uh, control of the slides. Yes. So uh, hi, everyone. And thanks a lot to Charita. And thanks to the Miracle team for organizing this webinar. Uh, very interesting stuff. And I'm going to try uh, in a few minutes, not take too much time, but give you a bit of you know, the miracle perspective on that and why miracle exists and how can we help. And I think a good starting point is, is that I think everyone agrees today that if companies and businesses such as, you know, the ones that you all involved in, uh, don't embrace the digital, they're, they're in a very dangerous spot. They're, they're unlikely to, to survive. And, and a lot of companies would react to me saying that by, you know, saying, Oh, but we've been investing in digital. But when we do some research and we actually try to understand the, the investments that companies do in digital, most of the time it revolves around three main areas. One is we're using digital to cut costs and improve efficiency. The other one is um, is I don't really do I don't really know what digital would do to me, but I use it to experiment. I'm experimenting things. And, and the third thing we hear a lot from the clients that we work with is that for a long time, digital has been, yeah, you know, we know it's important, but we can't do it really, we, we can't do it internally. So we'll kind of start a separate unit, kind of a startup outside of the company. We'll fund it and we'll see where it goes. And I think all these uh, three approaches to digital are clearly missing on how to really react and combat the ones that are that are winning today and that Sucharita presented uh, previously and um, and it's really about asking you know realizing that this is a journey and and miracle works with businesses that accept the fact that it's a journey and it starts by redefining you know the business scope and their competitive advantage and and most of the retail companies we work with one of the first question we kind of ask them is you know, is the future of your company to continue revolving around my, my model is basically to buy products cheap and resell them higher? Or is my, my future to find ways as a brand to enchant customers, to bring them around my brand and to serve them with more products and services and innovative distribution ways, uh, such as the ones that Sucharita has covered? And, and at Miracle, we profoundly believe that the right approach is to really consider your businesses as strong brands before being, you know, procurement models and, and, and margin models. And how do we take that brand and take it to the next step? And um, if, we, if we move to the next slide, um, it's really about, you know, figuring out how can I, with that brand, offer more 
products, services, experiences to learn more about my consumers and my customers and ultimately sell more. And whether I'm selling directly by making a margin or whether I'm selling by allowing others to transact with my customers through me and I'm making a commission, it doesn't matter because what matters at the end is the fact that I own the customer and I can engage with the customer much more than, than, than I would be able uh, before. And, you know, taking a step back and not, you know, talking again about what Sucharita has been saying, we can't ignore the fact that today um, marketplaces, models are dominating the world. And I was just as a, at a conference where some of the numbers are, are, you know, crazy around how many trillions of market cap today. So the, the combined market cap today of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google is basically uh, more than Canada, and it will be uh, next year's India's GDP. So definitely these models were, you know, very fast as a platform business, such as Airbnb, for example, you are able to come in and totally upset very established businesses without having to own the inventory, without having to have, you know, the employees or the, the, the assets. It's really something that no business can ignore anymore today if they want to be able to survive. And moving forward, um, just trying to get the next slide up. Oops. Uh, it all. I mean, at the end of the day, it all. It all comes back to 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 you know Amazon and how uh, with that approach of a marketplace and and. A, beyond that, that platform strategy that, that was presented by Sucharita, they now completely dominate the, the world. And one thing that people don't always realize that, that is illustrated in the next slide is the fact that today in the US, out of you know, 95 billion of uh, estimated gross merchandise value, so sales on Amazon, 63 billion is done through Amazon's marketplace. So over two thirds of Amazon's business in the US is done through third party sellers. And what people need to realize, it's not only that it's a, that it's a massive number uh, in itself, but it's only because Amazon has adopted that strategy of a marketplace already 12 years ago and that all other retailers have just been, you know, sitting there looking at them, looking at Amazon doing that through the creation of this network effect and platform strategy, they've come up with fulfillment by Amazon, creating another service to uh, improve their own logistics. They've come up with the cloud to, to serve also third parties. And all that platform strategy orig originates from the fact that Jeff Bezos already 20 years ago realized and said actually, so it would have been a great thing to listen to him, that he's not here to be a retailer. He's here to be a platform and, and, and building a brand and, and, and that's exactly what they've been doing. So we at Miracle, we exist because for the past 12 years, we've been convinced of that model, of that vision. We've had the opportunity as founders to operate marketplaces independently within large retail organizations. And we've basically come to the conclusion that, as I said, you're on a journey and that journey starts by redefining the business scope and the competitive advantage. And that if you don't have a marketplace strategy as part of that journey, the journey is already uh, lost because that marketplace model brings the ability to offer more if we go to the next slide, sorry, that, mar that, that marketplace strategy uh, brings the ability to offer more by getting more products, testing products, uh, testing new categories, offering more to your customers, learning more, what products could I sell in my stores? What products or services could I build around my, my offering? Uh, what is the cost? Am I making more money if I'm selling them myself or if I'm just taking a commission? What does this tell me about my customers? Could I build, could I invest in, you know, experience um, services or 
delivery services because I found out through the marketplace that my customers have expectations around more. And ultimately, I, I'm able to sell more. And, and over the past you know, six years now that we've been around, we've had the opportunity to embark on these journeys, on these transformative journeys with a lot of major brands around the world and help them redefine who they are and how they want to play in, in, this new, uh, in this new competitive landscape. And next slide, please. Okay. And yeah, so, you know, I'm not going to talk hours about Miracle, but uh, as I said, uh, it's, it's very enjoyable as a founder and a CEO of the company to be able to start conversations with some of the leading brands, leading retailers in the world that all start by saying the same thing, you know, uh, oh, we don't want to be, I mean, I've heard so many times, we don't want to be Amazon. Uh, our job is to be, uh, to select the products that we sell to our customers. But that's, I'm sorry to say, but it was true in the pre-platform era. Yes, the job of a retailer is still to be, to be selective, but it's to be selective within a broader scope of offering. Otherwise, customers are, are fleeing away and, 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 they're, and, and the others are progressing even more with you know, things like Alexa, which are already um, disintermediating retail in the house in a way. So, so all these threats need to be addressed and it all starts by making sure that you have the right offering and the right selection. And finally, uh, next next slide. Uh, it's it's really understanding that you know a marketplace is a win-win-win scenario. It's building an ecosystem, an ecosystem where you, your customers, and the partners that you bring on the ecosystem are all here to serve a purpose, and benefit from the 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 right organization of this ecosystem that involves you know, things around the quality of service provided by the third party partners. That involves the, the scope of and the breadth of choice that customers are able to find. And that involves also the mechanics under which you are operating this, uh, this platform strategy. Next slide, Anna, please. So, so that's, you know, uh, a very quick uh, intro about you know miracle and 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 the reason why we exist and um, and I think now we're we have some time for for questions. Yeah, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Futurita. We've had a few questions come in, but if anybody has any additional questions, please ask them in the questions tab, and we'll get to as many as we can. So the first question that came in is. What do you believe is the ideal monetization model for the B2B marketplace website? Um, Adrian, do you want to tackle that? Um, sure. Uh, do you, I mean, do you want to do you want to take it, Charita, or you want me to take it? Um, well, if there are any um, you know benchmarks that you have, um, I think that would probably be helpful, and then I can I can supplement with anything you add. Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to, I mean, I'm just making sure that I got the question right. But I think um, as I, going back to the, the last slide, I, I, I showed uh, a, a marketplace works when uh, it's, it's operated in a way that does, not, um, uh, that does not create too much advantages of one party over the other. And it's something that sometimes, you know, B2B wholesale distributors or retailers or companies we, we work with, they, they, they need to understand that the third parties that are going to join the marketplace, they need to be treated as partners. They, they can't be treated anymore as just, you know, suppliers that you're going to kind of squeeze, try and get the best prices and, 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 and ensure you get a great margin. So the other thing that is important also is that you're not the only marketplace around. So these partners that you're going to bring on, they have other alternatives. So you need to make sure that your value proposition to them is, is efficient and simple. And it means, of course, you need to show them that you're going to provide them with some, some business.
but that it's going to be easy for them to onboard your platform and that along the way you're going to provide them with you know services and, and opportunities to sell more so in terms of business model that translates at the end of the day it's sharing the value that you create so the natural business model that we see on marketplaces most of the time is taking a commission of the revenue which transacts through uh, through the platform sometimes you can have you can combine that or substitute that with you know flat monthly subscriptions you can also have some form of um, promotional opportunities where depending on the kind of marketplace you're operating you can sell you know more visibility or space but it doesn't have it needs not to kind of pervert the, the 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 customer the end customer experience so they're they're very different models but i'd say one thing and then i'll i'll, I'll stop talking a lot of people ask also you know how can we fight really amazon isn't it the winner takes all but one thing you need to understand is that from the the, the numbers we've seen we see how strategic the marketplace is to Amazon. And the sellers that are joining Amazon's marketplace, they're not, they're not very happy with the situation there because Amazon is over dominant. Amazon decides of the fate of sellers. Uh, so many sellers have told stories of how Amazon has shut them down uh, three weeks into the holiday season or Amazon looks at what sellers sell well and then they decide to kick them out and copy the products or do, the, do it themselves. So there is a real opportunity to actually attack Amazon by creating compelling value propositions for all these third party sellers that are, that are not satisfied of this kind of monopolistic situation. I couldn't agree more. I think that Adrian raises some great points and hopefully, um, hopefully some of that resonates with you. Great. The next question is, what are your views on reputed brands like Nike supplying directly to Amazon? Do you, see, do you foresee a shift in the retail marketplace model where brands reduce the supply chain and supply certain product ranges only to Amazon? Um, I think it's too early to, to tell. Um, it, I, I think that um, there, I, there, there will be a lot of, of brands that choose to hold out entirely, particularly um, if they're luxury brands. Um, and, and I think then that's one model is that you can look for alternative distribution um, around Amazon. Um, and then even if you are on Amazon, there, there may be um, ways and nuances that you can choose to even distribute there. Some of it could be that you only work through the third-party marketplace. Um, some of it could be that what you sell to Amazon could be very restricted. Um, so I think that that you, you know, I mean, it's a it's a really really um, nascent and emerging world. Um, you also have um, situations where things are, are fluid and they can change, particularly in fashion, where um, you know, kind of every year you have refreshes of new product. And I could easily see a situation where brands, um, you know, may choose to, you know, kind of lean into Amazon when they're not doing well. But then if something happens where they do do well, that they may decide to pull back. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's really ultimately, you know, kind of what's, what's at stake here. Um, we also are in a bit of a... Um, it, you know, kind of, there are a lot of inefficiencies that third-party marketplaces are taking advantage of now, particularly Amazon is taking advantage of now, with respect to inventory tracking. And um, the whole reason that, you know, kind of there are rogue sellers out there is because there's no way or there's no good way right now that anyone is is keeping tabs on what's where. And, um, you know, some of that is, is deliberate um, because, you know, sellers have, have long benefited from just selling units wantonly and, you know, kind of being really agnostic to, you know, kind of what market in, in Beijing things ultimately, you know, kind of surface at. Um, but, but I think that there's, um, you know, the best brands will not have that luxury in the future. And um, they will need to, to tighten their, the control and the distribution of their products. 
and um, you know they will rely on technology and a very very heavy um, you know legal um, system le legal repercussions. Um, you know, to kind of uh, to go after anybody who violates those terms. And um, once you have that becoming more commonplace, you have variability in pricing becoming less commonplace. Once you have variability in pricing becoming less commonplace, I think it becomes a much, much bigger, um, it, it levels the playing field for everybody else. Um, so, so you, you know, I think that, that that that's also you know part of the dynamic that you know kind of we're seeing um, we're seeing Amazon benefit from you, you know kind of this um, you know lack of control that brands have over their their uh, their distribution right now. Great, thank you, Sucharita. I think that's it for questions. If anybody has any additional questions, please reach out to marketing at miracle.com and we'll get them answered for you. So a big thank you to Adrian and Sucharita for the great presentation and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, again, slides and recording will be sent out in the next 24 hours, so be looking in your inbox for that. Adrian and Sucharita, would you like to end with anything else? Yeah, thank you all for joining today. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye. Bye.